So hello everyone, welcome to our ENCO keynote speaker interview and today we are hosting Dr. Mala. So ENCODE is a satellite event of the fans meeting and it will take place the 7th and the 8th of July in Paris. So it's the occasion for you to attend to good quality uh, research talk, workshop and networking. You also have the occasion to present your work uh, via posters or uh, to give a small talk and the uh, registration and the 28th of February. So please uh, go to the link in the description to have more detail. So today we are pleased to receive an outstanding researcher, Dr. Mala Chakravarti. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you so much, and thanks for the invitation to participate in this phenomenal event. So Mala Chakravarti is the leader of the Cobra Lab, standing for Computational Brain Anatomy Laboratory at the Cerebral Imaging Center at the Douglas Mental Health University Institute. The main topic of his research is exploring the anatomy of the brain, the way it matures over time, and investigate how alteration in the brain anatomy are linked to pathologies just like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, or schizophrenia. To this end, Dr. Chakravarti is leading an interdisciplinary team of neuroscientists, computer scientists, engineers, and physicists with complementary skill sets working toward the same goal. Together, they were able to develop advanced computational neuroanatomy techniques to decompose the geometric complexity of the brain anatomy. So we'll begin with the first question. We're well, very happy to have a speaker working in neuroimaging. Now, if you are not mistaken, you started your graduate studies with a bachelor in electrical engineering and a master in engineering. So what was that properly interest in neuroscience research? So that's a really, that's a very good question. Uh, I, I realized that early on that I, I wasn't uh, traditionally going to be a very good engineer. Uh, that was definitely part of the motivation. Um, I did a very particular type of program uh, in Canada where effectively you're, you're in school or working three semesters a year. So you alternate between going to school and then you find an internship or a stage in um in a company and then you come back to school and so on, right? So, um, and when I first started my university education, this seemed like a great idea and, and it probably was, you know, uh, um, it gave me some uh, sense of what working in uh, industry would be like. And what I found more often than not was that in the first two months of my internship uh, that um, everything would be really exciting. Uh, and then kind of after that, I would start getting bored. There'd be a routine there. I'm sorry that everything's dinging. Uh, there'd be a routine there that uh, just wouldn't be all that fun anymore. And I, I, I wasn't looking forward to, to going to work kind of in that last four months, last stage of the four months of my, of my job. And I apologize to any of my previous employers that are watching this, this video, but it was, it was definitely true. Uh, and then towards the end, I, I started working with students and with incoming students about their academic problems. And that was my job at the university for the last stage of my bachelor's degree. And I, I, I loved it. Um, I didn't come from a, a family that was involved in research. And I kind of didn't know how to get involved in research. I didn't have very many friends who were going in that direction. So that was a challenge. Um, but I did know a few things. I was... Uh, I was always very interested in biology and I was always very interested in um, the interface between how technology can help and inform biology. Uh, I didn't know what that looked like. I just thought of it as a very interesting idea. Um, and so I started looking around to what would satisfy that curiosity. Um, and all I knew about doing a master's degree was that it would be more school and I didn't really know what research projects looked like and I'd never done really any research in my undergraduate unlike a lot of people and I found a supervisor who was starting a lab uh we're, we're still very close friends Louis Collins um and he kind of took a chance on on me and I just fell in love with the work and at the beginning I was doing uh, a very engineering oriented problem which was uh how to use MRI imaging as a tool for surgical planning um, uh, especially in the context of Parkinson's disease. Uh, in those days, thalamotomies, pallidotomies, and then eventually deep brain stimulation. 
And what I found was it was fascinating. I was working with clinicians. I was working on patient data. I was working on, uh, I was going to the OR and testing out software. Um, I, you know, it was, it was super dynamic and, and I just fell in love with the work and then continued. Um, and so it was a bit by chance. I mean, uh, one of my options after finishing engineering school is I was, I was actually this close to going to Japan to go teach English for a couple of years. And uh, I thought, and then these offers came in to do graduate school very, very late because my marks weren't very good. And uh, I was like, okay, well, I might as well try it. And, you know, many years later, 20 years later, I guess here we are. So um, I don't know if that, that's maybe a very long answer to a very simple question, but uh, that's, that's kind of the path. It was a lot of luck and a lot of uh, being in the right place at the right time, often with the right people. Uh, and I think that was, became very clear to me at the very outset is that, you know, research is so much about who you're, you get to work with and collaborate with. That really brings the joy of research to, to the work. Thank you. That was uh, actually really interesting and not that long because perhaps a lot of people can, can relate to your experience, especially at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, choosing the research also because it's more challenging perhaps. Yeah. So, so that's nice. Uh, I will go with the second question. Uh, as uh, my colleague Annalise already said before, your research main goal consists in a better understanding of the structure, function relationship of the healthy and ill brain. Now, considering that social and environmental factors can impact humans in many ways, for example, including genetics, what are the challenges in predicting the effect of the environmental and genetic changes in the shape of the human brain? So this is a really interesting problem, and it's something that we've been grappling with for a very long time. I work at a research institute that's done a lot of work in kind of this, this interface between um, the molecular and the environmental or the transcriptional and the environmental, if you will. Um, you know, a lot of great scientists who have been there before I ever got there have been working on these questions. And I, I find it fascinating, right, that, that you, know, you can you can there are environmental factors out there that leave a, almost a signature, an imprint of the brain. I, I recently saw a talk uh, where someone said that the neuroanatomy of the brain is kind of like a life history. Um, and I, I really like that idea. And so life history can include, you know, things in your early life, even before you're born. Um, and so the current context we're living in now, I think, is very much proof of that. There's a reason I'm doing this from my home. Uh, and, and so... Um, I think the challenges there are that one, that space is so multidimensional, right? How do you even focus in on the risk factor that you want to look at? Um, and so in our, in our group, in our laboratory, what we're really trying to do is really focus in on risk factors that really, one, uh, provide an indication of, uh, that, that are risk factors for major psychiatric illness. So one that we've worked on extensively in the last little while is exposure to infection in utero, so during the fetal development. Now, I'd like to say that we were working on this because of COVID, but we actually started well before. It's a well-known model, but we were trying to use MRI as a way of kind of really expanding on that. Um, now, when you do work like that, some of these things work very well, you know, in humans, but you can imagine the challenges of that and working on that in, in, in human samples. So we actually turned to not just humans, but animal models. And so the, the, the focus in the lab is actually bidirectional, bidirectional translation, where we can use the animal model work to really focus in on what we'd like to study on in the humans and then work backwards and say, okay, well, we see these observations in our human samples, how do we model this in, 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 the, in the animal models? Um, and then, you know, MRI then becomes a really nice screener for almost an indication of where we should look. Um, so you can imagine that you see a, a structural change map uh, that is, you know, hypothesis driven, but but basically, you know, it provides some hypothesis free and hypothesis driven information. You can use that to link it to behavior, for example, and then drill in deeper to figure out what are molecular transcriptional changes that may underlie that. And that's the tactic we're using. And so obviously there's a lot of advantages to doing this in animal models because you can you can do this, you know, in both a hypothetical hypothesis driven way where we know that for example maternal 
immune activation or exposure to maternal infection should alter brain development. But why you should look in one region or over another for transcription is unclear. So we can at least use this as a screener to kind of go deeper. And then more recently, we've been taking these approaches and moving them into big data sets involving humans. Uh, and then there's obvious challenges there. Um, one way to overcome these challenges is using tools like the Allen Human Brain Atlas uh, to get kind of whole brain transcri transcriptomic information that we then match to anatomical maps that, um, that we get. So, you know, this is one example. There are others where we're using this kind of uh, combined species approach uh, to our brain mapping techniques. Okay. And uh, actually, my next question was uh, indeed about development. Uh, since we saw that some of your work on a, we saw some of your work on irritability in brain structures, and uh, we were wondering whether it is possible to predict how the brain will evolve in response to our current environmental circumstances. Uh, that uh, you mentioned COVID. COVID could be also an example. Uh, COVID infection could be also an example. I don't know if you can tell us more about this. Yeah, I mean, I think this is this is where this idea of having this bi-directional approach or this multi-species approach can really help because um, we can get information rather quickly relative to humans and, and animal models. Um, an MRI provides an assay that is translatable across animal models and humans. And I think that's fundamentally very important. Uh, um, and so can I tell you how the current uh, pandemic will impact brain development in everyone born in this? No, I, I definitely can't. Uh, um, you know, but I hope we can provide some indices. So things like early life stress, for example, parental stress, uh, these are really important factors that will shape, you know, um, the development of offspring and development of children, you know, for years. Uh, the other thing I think what's more important, and this is where we're going to, is um, how are those effects dampened? How are they minimized? And so, you know, postnatally, things like uh, early life environment, uh, enrichment, um, whether you look at this in humans or or animal models, can you get some indices as to how, um, what can be protective, uh, either proximally or in the long term? Um, I think this is this is really important. The other thing, you know, one thing we've noticed in our in our animal data, for example, when we look at the effect of maternal immune activation, at least in the way we've done it, and there's different data out there. But one thing we found very fascinating is that actually what ends up happening is that everything depends on when you look, and so in the way we do things. We use neuroimaging as a longitudinal measure, right? So the nice thing with MRI is it's in vivo. We can examine anatomy of the brain or function of the brain, you know, in multiple time points. So your temporal resolution or your age is really just uh, limited by when we examine the brain uh, in the scanner, right? So if you examine, so for example, in our first major study on this, we we looked at the at the brain development from childhood, so just after weaning of the pups. Uh, all the way to adulthood at 90 days in mice. And what you see is that there's this change in behavior and brain anatomy that just closes up at adulthood, right? So it's this transient issue, not a, um, not a long-term outcome necessarily. And that's, I think, important information. Something that, you, you know, you can, if we only looked at the adolescent time point, there would have been causes for grave concern. But uh, the fact that the, it, it creates a risk window is something I think that's very important that, you know, is actionable um, by ourselves, by others, uh, as a way of examining how to, uh, what makes it worse, what makes it better, so on. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, during the ECHOS conference that we organized, students have also the possibility to attend several type of workshop. And one of those is uh, credibility neuroscience with a focus on scientific integrity, reproducibility, and open science, which is still a critical subject on in, in the research. We know that your lab is promoting open science and reproducibility by publicly disseminating part of the software and Atlas data that you develop and obtain. And at which point of your career did you realize that open science was the right way? And what do you think is still necessary to do to promote it? It's a really good question. I don't know if there was a turning point. 
I, I will admit that early on I was paranoid like everyone else. Uh, you know, what if I give this away and um, someone else beats me to some finding or, or something like that. And uh, I, I've since totally let that go. I, there's, no, there's no point in thinking that way. Um, what I've come to realize is that, you know, this idea of there being a scientific race of being the first to do something or the first to show something is effectively not a useful strategy. Uh, and once you kind of realize that it's not a useful strategy, then everything else falls into place. If the idea is to do the best work possible, then the best work possible will emerge. So some of my most cited papers, uh, uh, if that's a measure of, you know, amazingness, uh, um, but if that's, a, if that's any measure at all, our journals that are methodological have uh, medium impact factors, but those papers get cited you know, dozens of times a year. And it means that that software is being used. Um, and a lot of those software tools are tools that we, all of them are ones we disseminate publicly. Same thing with the atlases. Um, and in fact, when you, you know, software engineers have a way of saying this, which is very true which is that if you, you know, if you just write the tools, if you just write the paper, it's just an advertisement for your code. That's all it is. It's not necessarily science. So if I think of science as an evolving process that requires the interaction of human beings, then the product that we have, which would be our software or atlases, needs to be observable um, and needs to be used or else it doesn't really matter if I'm the only one using it. No one can ever replicate my findings. No one ever can examine our findings. It's not worthwhile. I mean, we, we've, we've moved this way. All our mouse data that we generate, we, we publish it with the paper, um, right down to the transcriptional, transcriptomic data, whatever. And you know, those, those data sets take years to, to acquire. And I would love if people would go out and reuse them and generate knowledge that we hadn't thought of generating. I think there's, there's a lot to be said for that. Um, so there wasn't like a turning point, but I will say that I've never regretted it. I've never regretted making something public. Uh, um, people have used our atlases to to beat us to software solutions that we were we had in mind originally, and that's okay. I mean, like that's great. Uh, there's there's room for plenty of voices in science, and I hope one of them can be the voices from my lab as well. Okay, thank you for all that. Um, because you are the youngest PI that we host, uh, we wanted to, to take the occasion for asking about transition between being a postdoc to um, a PI. So going back to your CV, uh, we can see that after uh, your postdoc, you become an independent scientist and an adjoint scientist in Toronto. And then you move to uh, Montreal to become a scientist in the Douglas Center. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us more about uh, this lifetime and uh, your past? How did you choose and pick uh, the job and how your research uh, topic uh, become uh, written? It's a really excellent question. Uh, there's um, equal parts desperation and, uh, and strategy in that, I think. Um, you know, at some point you're, um, I mean, I think what's, this is something I've heard a lot and I, I, it's a bit off topic, but it, bear with me and it will, I think, integrate very well. So one thing I've been noticing in um, my lab a lot recently is people worried about uh, their life trajectories alongside their career trajectories, right? So what it would mean to have a family uh, at the, during your postdoc or at the beginning of your life as a investigator. Um, and you know, you know, I, I I will never give birth to anything, but uh, I will certainly you know I'm I'm a father. Or, you know I'm I'm home today with my my child who's having you know side effects from from his second vaccine, uh, and that's just part of my life. Now certainly I'm I'm in a place in my career where I can say I'm just not going in today, and I have to change my meeting schedule or or something like that. It wasn't always like that, um, so. When I was a postdoc, I was very worried about getting having an academic career, uh, like a lot of people. I was extremely worried. I was even more worried when we found out that 
I was going to have a kid and I had to make decisions about you know, how long can I sustain this path before I have kind of a more uh, secure position for the long term. So uh, it was a it was a concern for me. Um, you know, people have to eat. I have I have a family that you know I want to have thrive. And so at that point, when I started my postdoc in Toronto, I kind of gave myself three years because I'd done a previous postdoc. I'd I worked a little bit in between and then migrated back to academia. Um, and uh, and so that period of life was a bit stressful because I'd given up a job. So as I wanted, I really wanted to 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 pursue my ambitions and my ideas. Uh, but you have to convince someone that you're worthwhile to invest in in terms of your ideas and and your ambitions. So um, at that phase, I was pretty shameless about telling people that you know I'm here, I'm in Toronto, I'm looking for a job, I'm interested. Um, I gave talks to wherever they would have me. Uh, I made it you know to whoever was organizing. I, I would make sure I had meetings with senior investigators at those institutions, or at least ask, at least ask for them. And I'd, I'd let people know, like, I am on the job market. I am interested in staying in Toronto. Um, it was tough, though, because I'm not used to doing that. Uh, and it worked. I mean, basically, someone had a job call and said, oh, this would fit for you. And things kind of spiraled from there. Um, so part of it was strategic, you know, in terms of how I leverage those jobs. I would have been happy. I, I really did want to stay in psychiatry and in brain development. But um, at the time, I was a bit flexible about what, what kind of institution I would be working in and, and the questions I would pursue, uh, which I think served me well. It's not the advice that everyone gets, but it served me well and it allowed me to kind of develop a, you know, a research program. I started with my strengths, like developing software, analyzing big data sets, which at the time was... Um, you know, a skill set that not everyone had necessarily. I think it's more universal now. Um, or certainly it's a skill set that's required, at least in neuroimaging, to, to be successful. Um, and then uh, a colleague of mine told me about this position coming in at, at the Douglas, where uh, you know, basically I would start in this new imaging center that was very young, and uh, I could kind of define the trajectory of, of how imaging research got conducted there. That sounded very attractive to me. So I applied without knowing what would happen and uh, it worked. And now I just get to do the things that I like to do um, with students who I like to work with and collaborators. So, um, but I'm not gonna pretend it wasn't tough or anxiety provoking. I mean, I think that's, for, for, for some people it's not, right? For some people they're, you know, they're gonna get jobs. Uh, you know, I, I was hoping I would get a job, but I don't think it's, you know, it's it's not obvious, right? There's no there's no clear way to do that in a lot of places, right? I mean, in France, you have the competition system, which has a bit more clarity in terms of when you apply and where you apply. Most places aren't like that, right? Uh, and so you really need to, you know, engage your mentors, talk to your mentors, uh, figure, talk to people who have jobs available um, or who might. Uh, and then give talks, and, you know, show, show yourself off, show that you're excited for this and that you're ready for this. I think, you know, your excitement should, should come through and, and your fearlessness should come through as well. I know that's not an easy thing to do. It wasn't for me, but, uh, but certainly that, that'd be some of the advice that I would provide at this, at this stage of the career. And by the way, it is something I am more than happy to talk about with anyone whenever, because I do think academics do a very poor job of teaching their trainees of how to move on to the next step. And, and, and I think it's something universally we could do better at. Yeah, we agree. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so one underlying question is when you become a scientist, um, how hard or just if you can uh, tell us about how uh, is it to start a lab alone or maybe with help? How um, do you write your research question? Um, buy materials, uh, recruit trainee, like how it is to become, right. yeah, to start a lab? So, I mean, that was interesting because no one really had a, a good footprint for me. No one, no one had given me a good, again, 
another thing that we could do better at, I think, is academics. Um, when I was in Toronto, it was uh, there were challenges for sure. Um, so I, I was lucky. So it was interesting because I had given so many talks in Toronto, very shamelessly, uh, at the time of 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 my postdoc. What ended up happening was that young students who had seen those talks reached out to me when I got my first PI position. Um, and so I was very lucky in that sense. Some of my, I had some really excellent trainees at the outset who I'm still very good friends with to this day. Um, and they're, yeah, I mean, I owe a lot. I'm in debt very much to their work and their commitment to, to helping me build a lab. Um, it was, it was, and it's one of those things I, I was in it with them. It was very exciting. You know, I, I helped set up the first, you know, computer network in my lab. I helped, you know, I, I generated all the data for my first grants myself. I, uh, it's a very different time than where I am now. Um, but it was exciting. Everything was new and we were all kind of invested together. At least that's the kind of sense of community I tried to develop amongst my trainees and, and things like that. So, you know, in those days I would, I would try to code with them. I would, I would, I would look at data with them. I would, you know, it was only a small team of four or five of us. So it was, it was easy enough to do. Um, things have changed. I have more responsibility and I have less time to do stuff like that. Um, but even when I changed institutions, it was, uh, you know, developing my research questions new that would you know, integrate with the, Doug the Douglas. So really starting to think about risk factors. So I, I went from more of a technical focus in Toronto to really kind of this interface between neuroscience and technology at, in Montreal, where, you know, thinking about risk factors that, um, that impact mental health outcomes, right? And so that's where a lot of our work is interfaced here, whether it's in the animal models or the, the clinical work that we've been doing. And, um, and that's kind of where I've stayed and that's where I enjoy being and kind of bring the new technology to that. But even when we came here, you know, we had to start a whole animal imaging program and we needed students to do that. And we needed people who could do the animal handling to do that. And there were so many technical difficulties to overcome before our first paper started coming out. Um, and I think, you know, what I realized that when you, when you deal with technology and you deal with new technologies that are new to you, there's generally no quick fix. You have to really learn the technology and really understand its limitations and understand its strengths, uh, understand if it's actually giving you reasonable biological signal, um, all those things. And that takes sometimes a year or two before you can actually use it as a scientific tool. Um, I maybe learned that lesson too late because uh, you, you're so enthusiastic, you want to race to the finish. But, you know, then you look at the data and it's not exactly what you were hoping for and you don't know what the problem is. Uh, and that happens to everyone. Um, uh, but, you know, the, the scientific questions we ask are really a combination of what I'm interested in, in terms of like the overall parameter space. But I really look at what my students and my trainees are curious about and really work with them to create projects that are provocative to them, right? Because they have to live with that for, you know, if it's master's in, in Montreal, it's two years. If it's PhD, it's, you know, four, five, six years, depending on the student and depending on the project, right? So who wants to work on something that I told them would be interesting for four years? They need to be interested, right? So I, I spent a lot of time crafting those questions with the students before, you know, we even get to the let's work on data phase. And then once that happens, then uh, then actually the grants end up coming out of that and the research questions end up coming out of that. And I, I find that much more interesting and fun than like having some theory I'd like to impose on a student, for example. That's my personal approach. Okay, super. And um, if we can... Um join all uh, and all the challenges that you faced uh, during your trainee uh, phase to leader um, like just to to resume them and maybe the related advice uh, that we can learn from your experience so working group <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> working groups um uh find things you're passionate about working on because you'll be working on them for a long time uh and find find out supervisors and mentors who are advocates, I think for you as a trainee, right? That will 
that will nurture your interests and nurture your career path and are interested in where you're going uh, and not just what you're providing to their lab, you know, today. Uh, I think that's, um, that's clearly necessary. Uh, and surround yourself with people like that. Be collaborative, be open, um, and find people who can complement the skill sets you have. So if you're a great neuroscientist with limited technical background, find those people, work with them, and vice versa. Um, I think that's very, very important. Does that do it? Does that summarize it pretty well? <laughs> yeah, it's okay. I apologize for the rambling. Yeah. No, it's really cool, actually, that we can speak about this kind of topic and um, like that you can share with us your experience. So also we have um, a workshop that we propose for the attendees during the ENCODE, which is um, about mental health. So mental health is um, an important subject as a neuroscientist. So we can find a lot of paper about uh, stress, chronic stress, etc. But uh, as neuroscientists, we are also human beings. So we were wondering um, how you deal with um, period of pressure and what kind of directive do you propose to do better science uh, for you uh, and for your team um, in a healthy environment? Um, I think there's a few things. I mean, I, I would like our environment to be healthy. I think it's very important. Uh, certainly, you know, I've definitely seen a lot of students having a hard time in this kind of virtual um, mm. virtual era of science, for sure. Uh, and it's it's a challenge for a lot of people, especially people who've just moved here, uh, have no support networks. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that speaks to a lot of your attendees. Um, so we've done a few things in the lab where we try to do our best to encourage interaction, whether it be in person or on Zoom. Um, so we have, the lab's pretty big. So we have, we try to, instead of just having the lab meetings, try to facilitate smaller group meetings so people can get to know each other over the course of two months where they meet. We also have, um, we started a new thing called the, uh, it's a terrible name, reproducibility buddies. And it's a, it's an idea that I got from, it's not my idea. It's an idea I got from Ted Sathers uh, who's a phenomenal scientist at UPenn. And, uh, he basically has students paired up um, so that they check each other's analysis and code and make sure that they can be replicated. So you're talking about your science in a way that is like, not just here's what I found, but here's what I did all the way through. And can you do that too, right? And so you're by definition, every couple of weeks talking to someone in a very you know, profound way about the work that you did in a very detailed way, right? So everyone benefits from this, from the most senior PhD students to undergraduates who are just starting their work in the lab. And I think it's, it's, a critical, um, it's a critical part of things that we've done. Um, so how that speaks to the mental health question that you asked, uh, I mean, it, it really is about trying to break isolation as best as I can as a supervisor for people. I, I mean, I, I, I can't do much outside of what is, what I, we can prescribe in work, but, um, I like to think, I, I listen to the challenges that my students are having, which are unique from student to student, um, and, and try to find them either help or, or you know, in, in a lot of cases, what people need to be told uh, or what I have to suggest to people uh, and students and trainees is that now is a good time to stop working. Now is a good time to, yeah, when was the last time you took a vacation? When, you know, what you should, what I think you should be doing is come back in two weeks, turn your laptop off. You know, there's no, there's no value in feeling stuck uh, or being stuck because you don't have kind of the energy or the, or the motivation right now to work at home and, and, and try to debug this on your own, right? Like re being refreshed will be very, very important to, to doing this. And so will it make things slower? Maybe, maybe not, but at least you'll feel better for the, for the outcome that you get. Um, and certainly for myself, I think what I've, I, I work hard. I'm not gonna pretend I don't. I'm not gonna pretend that my day is nine to five or 40 hours a week, cause it's not, uh, you know, I, I, but you know, I'm, I like to think of myself as a, you know, I, I get energy from spending time with my family. Uh, you know, I, I encourage my, my trainees to have and not give up on their interests outside of science. I mean, um, you know, I. I live in Montreal and uh, we're fortunate enough to have 
lots of snow right now. And uh, I went, I went cross country skiing this morning before, you know, my family woke up, you know, and I spent an hour just tootling around on cross country skis. And that's important for me. And that's important for my mental health and, and my health. So, you know, I, I definitely have things in my life that I turn to, to, to stimulate that, you know, um, you know, I, I read non-science often uh, uh, and I enjoy it. And um, so, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, to, again, to summarize, you know, having uh, the ability to, to, you know, th these are questions you can ask your supervisor, right? Like, what do you do to promote a healthy environment? You know, I think it's not, what, what do you do to promote, what happens to your students when they leave here? You know, I think all these things reduce anxiety about what you're doing. Uh, because if you know your supervisor has a track record of pushing students into the next stage of their career, I think whatever that is, it doesn't have to be a professorship. It doesn't have to be, but it can be policy. It can be uh, funding. It can be also, you know, there's all sorts of jobs out there available, um, especially now uh, for people with, who are bright and excited to work, work on interesting questions. So, you know, is your supervisor even aware of that? Uh, you know, all these things, I think, reduce anxiety about your current circumstance and, and, and give you a little bit of hope for what's to come. I mean, for me, my PhD was like the most exciting time in my life. I never really, I really was. It was so much fun uh, working with interesting people. And I'm, I'm still friends with a lot of those people today. And you know, I, I hope the same for my students. Absolutely. Thank you for your answer. Now on a different subject, every year ENCODE has a general theme. Um, so for the next conference, we chose working across scales in neuroscience, reflecting the fact that neuroscientists study the nervous system at different levels, um, as well as spatial and temporal scales. So your research group is composed of physicians, engineers, and neuroscientists. Um, so how is it to be the leader of such a diverse group of people? It's fantastic. Uh... It's, it's so much fun. Uh, and it, you know, it, I get to choose who I work with every day, which I don't think a lot of people can, can say. Um, you know, I, I really enjoy, that's the, best, that's the part I enjoy the most about, about my, my job for sure, is, is working with trainees. And you know, I actually enjoy revising manuscripts and, 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 them, and, and working with them to craft stories and things like that. And I enjoy people surprising themselves, right? I mean, one of my favorite questions for, and something everyone should think about, uh, uh, was at the end of someone's thesis. Like, what, what is the thing that you did that surprised you the most, that you didn't think you could ever do, that you would ever do? And I think watching people kind of do bits of that every day is, uh, is really gratifying. Um, and so, you know, we have a lot of students who didn't know how to code, how to, write a for loop when they even started or an if statement or what that even meant. And, you know, then they're, they're very complex statistical analyses or very complex computational analyses to, to get their thesis done. And, and they were surprised by how much they enjoyed it. You know, they, they just thought that was the domain for other people, someone else. And then all of a sudden they were like, oh, it's like detective work. It's, it's fascinating. And uh, so they, 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 they started loving the process of science um, and, and what that meant, right? That, you know, you're, you're moving towards an end product. Um, and so you only get that if you have that kind of multidisciplinary kind of group where people are here to learn about a whole bunch of things. Um, and I think this is what allows us, I mean, to the first part of the question, it's what allows us to bridge across scales. I mean, that's what we try to do in the lab is connecting behavior to an array of phenotypes right down to the molecule. Um, and I think that's where we want to be. Uh, um, and it's our systems level approach to, to neuroscience. Thank you. And so for the last question of this interview, do you have any suggestions for our attendees for networking at the conference despite their scientific interest or their background? Yeah, I think uh, yeah, lots. Um, uh, talk to people. I mean, one, the people that are at the conference with you are going to be your peers for years, if not decades to come. And I've certainly lived that. Uh, and it's great, you know, and it's, it's, it becomes a network of people that you can rely on from around the world. Um, 
And it's a real privilege that that's the thing, right? It's a real privilege that that becomes kind of your life, that you have an international life that, you know, you can have collaborators in Mexico, the US, uh, Japan, Australia, Europe, wherever. I mean, it's, it's, it's such a privilege. Um, so I, I would really, you know, get, get, take the time to know the people who are around you. You know, networking doesn't mean just finding like the top scientist in the room and, and kind of making sure you stand out. Networking also means like, you know, knowing what people in your generation are doing. Now, when it comes to trying to meet the top scientist in the room, I think that's also very important too. And you shouldn't be shy. I think you want to be around people who enjoy science. And hopefully, you know, the more senior members of anything you go to enjoy science. So I was, uh, I, I gave, when I was actually just on the verge of getting my first guy position, I gave, um, I was invited, actually no, my, my supervisor at the time asked me to go give a, a talk on his behalf because he couldn't do it. And it was a trainee-led session. And then they had a night at the pub after the fact. And what, and so all the PIs at the night of the pub sat away from the trainees. So all the speakers were on like one floor of the pub and all the trainees were on the other. I was like, well, doesn't this defeat the purpose of, of doing this whole thing? And, but I was, you know, I was junior. I didn't know where to go. And I followed the, the senior people because uh, I was part of the speaker group at that point. And you know, one of the first times in my life. And then I was there with, you know, one of the, the real pioneers in MRI research um, in general. And he stayed, he, he, as soon as everyone left, he grabbed me and said, okay, let's go see what the students are doing. Uh, you know, and he was close to retirement at this time. And he spent all night just fielding questions at the pub from dozens of graduate students who were there at this conference to, to, to network, right? And those are the people you want to find. Uh, you know, and, and they're, they're out there. Um, and if they're not enthusiastic about talking to trainees, you know, for your future work, I think you have your answer. Uh, um, I had a student who ended up spending about a year in my lab and uh, I met her at a conference. And the way I met her was that about three or four times she was trying to get up the courage to come and talk to me. I'd like to think I'm not very intimidating. Uh, so I'd see someone kind of, the only reason I noticed is I see someone who looked like they were coming to talk to me and then they'd run away. Uh, and then that happened three or four times. And then she finally did it. And she said, I, I didn't know that I could talk to you like this. I'm like, there's, there's, there's no barrier. I mean, there's nothing. I want you to come talk to me. Um, and I think it's important to find the people who are, you know, share your enthusiasm for the work. Um, and beautiful things will come out of that in terms of the science that gets produced. So um, go talk to people. It's, you know, if, if, if the PIs have lost their love for talking about science, it's, it's, it's their problem, not yours. And so they should want to be able to talk to, to the people who are doing the actual work, which is, which is all the trainees. Thank you. It was a lot of interesting tips, suggestions, <laughs> and uh, experience stories uh, to, to learn um, from. And uh, it was really a pleasure, honor to virtually meet you. <laughs> and we are looking forward to meet you in person uh, on the next Encodes conference in Paris. I'm Thank you very... again for being with us, Dr. Chakravarti. Thanks so much. And thanks for this opportunity. I'm looking forward to the meeting. <laughs>